Uh, we entitled this session, uh, Looking Forward, uh, Building a, a More Prosperous Future in a Dynamic Region, uh, which was also the, the overall title of this, uh, these two days, uh, this two-day event that we've had here in Istanbul. The idea here is really to kind of look ahead. Uh, we've looked at a little bit at the past and certainly a lot of present tense concerns on the energy side, on the economic side, on the political side. Uh, here, talk a little bit about some of the strategies uh, that individual countries need to be thinking about to build prosperity for the future. Uh, and, and in particular to hear from uh, two ministers and from the private sector to kind of fill that picture out uh, for, uh, for those of us who are here and hopefully there will be, I'm sure there will be a few others that, uh, that, straggle, uh, that straggle in from the previous, uh, previous event. Uh, the Atlantic Council is extremely grateful to uh, Turkish uh, Finance Minister Mehmet Shimshek in particular for being here. We're, we're very grateful to all of our participants but I want to particularly note Minister Shimshek, who has spoken at each of the previous gatherings we've had here in Istanbul. He has been very supportive of what we're trying to do, both in general uh, in this country and in this region, and in particular uh, supportive of what we're doing in these Atlantic Council energy and economic, uh, economic uh, summits. Uh, Minister Shimshek is a uh, second term member of the Turkish parliament. Uh, he is in his second term, I guess we could say, as a minister here, having started as economy minister and moved to the finance portfolio uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, before entering politics, uh, he worked for Merrill Lynch. He has important private sector experience that will also, I th both leavens his work as a minister, but will also leaven our discussions here. Uh, he, I in addition to that part of his portfolio, I at least feel a little bit of kinship with him uh, because many, many, many years ago, uh, he worked at the American Embassy at Ankara as an economic analyst. Uh, and I, I was very pleased and proud to talk about that with our embassy staff when I was there. There's a bright future for you uh, in international finance and potentially in Turkish politics if, uh, if you decide to go in that direction. I'm also very grateful that Minister Dobrev can be with us. Uh, his predecessor, uh, uh, attended these events in 2010 and 2011, uh, spoke with us at the Atlantic Council in Washington. Uh, Bulgaria is a good and important friend of the Atlantic Council, and we're very grateful uh, that you uh, can be here as well, uh, Mr. Minister. Um, let me do briefly two bits of housekeeping before I turn the proceedings over to our moderator, uh, Bob Abernathy, a member of the Atlantic uh, Council Board of Directors. Uh, first, you have on the desks in front of you a questionnaire. Uh, we'd ask you to please uh, fill it out and check some boxes as appropriate to give us some feedback about, uh, about this two days of worth of events, what was interesting, what was maybe less interesting, what would you like to see more of, less of, uh, et cetera. This will be very helpful to us as we work to continue uh, to improve this event and develop it uh, over time. Uh, the last thing I'll note, uh, and this is, I think is especially for those of you that might not be at uh, tonight's dinner, um, at dinner tonight, uh, Atlantic Council President and CEO Fred Kemp uh, will more formally announce the dates for next year's, the tentative dates for next year's Energy and Economic Summit here in Istanbul. We, we announced last year that this would be our long-term home. Uh, we plan to do this next year, the same two-day period keyed to the American calendar, uh, we have done this for several years now on the Thursday, Friday before our American Thanksgiving week. American Thanksgiving is next week. Uh, in 2013, Thanksgiving is a little bit later. So are the tentative dates we're planning on, please mark these in your diary, are November 21, 22. We look forward to seeing all of you, uh, all of you there. Uh, with no further ado, let me uh, turn it over to Bob Abernethy. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. I want to thank you for everything you've done in making this conference possible. I think you were the driving force that put it all together, came up with the ideas of the program content. Um, you've done a fabulous uh, job. You came into it uh, with knowing not only Turkey, but this whole region intimately before you uh, started in this process. So we appreciate that. 
I'd also like, I'm vice chairman of the board of the Alliance Council and also a chair of its programs committee. And I would like to say a, a word of thanks and appreciation on behalf of my colleagues um, to Fred Kemp. We, uh, Fred came in about five years ago uh, at, to an organization which was uh, 45 years old and was sleepy and needed waking up, and he sure did. We are alive and going places. Uh, the organization is creative. It's pushing back the frontiers of thinking in a half a dozen to a dozen different uh, areas of, of, of scholarship in international uh, and Atlantic relations. Um, it's all because of the leadership that Fred has exhibited, and we are grateful. Thank you, Fred. Um, the uh, conference this year was renamed, and uh, that is, uh, was done for several reasons. One, it was done for um, recognizing that Turkey's interests, and we're grateful for being, uh, having had Turkey as our host for three out of the four years of the conference, are really uh, reaching out much more globally than they used to be. And they're becoming a player that's uh, very much more active in, in parts of the world that are a further distance um, from Istanbul and Ankara than they used to be. So that's one of the reasons. The second reason is that we think the, the issues are interdependent and they affect the whole globe. And we're interested in expanding the geography in order to be able to expand the issue base in years to come and look forward to coming back to uh, Istanbul uh, again. So in that regard, uh, we, understanding that we're going through this process of trying to expand the energy discussions that we're having on a continuing basis, um, I want to second Ross's comment that we would be very grateful for your observations, your ideas about this particular session and also what you think the Atlantic Council ought to be doing in the future uh, in this energy arena, and a matter of fact, in any portion of our work in order to make us more successful in the objectives that we've, uh, we've set forward. I would like, I think um, Ross did a pretty good job of introducing two of the three people on the, on the panel, so I won't repeat his effort there. I just wanted to welcome uh, Ibrahim uh, Turhan, uh, who is head of the uh, stock exchange here, who uh, is really, I guess, um, made possible, along with the Minister of Finance and his colleagues, the tremendous um, record that you see Turkey do in, in the production of a 10% or thereabouts gross national um, product uh, increase there that they've had when most everyone else including my home country, has been way, way um, below that. So uh, he has uh, got a master's degree and a PhD in uh, financial economics. He got it here from uh, um, Memara, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, university here in, uh, in Istanbul. And he also has been associated with the uh, London School of Economics and the uh, Financial Policy Commission. Monetary Policy Working Commission of that school. So welcome and thank you. Um, I would like um, to ask our minister from Turkey to um, comment on a little bit about how he brought about that spectacular increase in the Turkish economy and what he what he thinks about what he needs to do, given where Europe is today, to sustain um, Turkey's position in its uh, economic development and also to contribute ideas and other sources of help to um, the rest of Europe and its, its recovery from its position. So do you want to use the lectern for a few minutes or do you want to talk for your chair? Over there. Thank you. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, members of press, my colleagues, Minister, 
I'm delighted to be here with you. I'd like to congratulate Atlantic Council for uh, the summit. Yes, I've been here before. Uh, I think this is my third time. And you know, top quality, really, uh, summit. And I'm delighted that Istanbul has become the center and, and the scope of it is obviously, uh, you know, has changed in a way that is still energy dominated, but other subjects are also uh, now important part of the agenda. The answer to your question, um, well, uh, in, in a couple of minutes, uh, it's, we have focused on providing investors markets with a medium term fiscal and macro framework. I think that was absolutely critical because uh, you know, there was a lot of dust in the air in 2008, 2009, very little visibility. And almost every country has suffered on the back of the global financial crisis. We needed to prove that this was just one of a shock, that the good fundamentals we had built starting from 2002 onwards were not temporary gains, they were actually solid gains and that the, the sort of fiscal discipline, the, the downward path in debt to GDP ratio would be sustained, and ultimately that growth would resume. So I think the first, I mean, uh, I mean, this is still probably relevant for some of the European countries because the adjustment that is required is so significant. It is very hard to see how that can be sustained unless you can come up with a credible program uh, that ultimately would allow you to do it gradually. Because what Europe needs, what we need in every country, you need growth. That is absolutely clear. Without growth, you cannot achieve any adjustment. You know, you cannot forever pursue fiscal adjustment when there is no growth, and then it becomes unsustainable. We've invested in people. And in particular, during the global crisis, and I think going forward is still relevant, uh, we decided that active labor market policies were absolutely critical. You know, preserving employment, but also boosting employment was critical, and I think going forward is still relevant. Um, you know, a few years ago, if you go back to 2007 or 2008, in active labor market uh, sort of programs, we had only like 30,000 people. This year, in the first 10 months of the year, we have about 400,000 people. Now, that's why we've been able to create about 4.2 million net jobs since the crisis. This is quite significant, even by sort of global standards. Uh, so job creation is absolutely critical while having a program that is credible uh, in terms of fiscal, in terms of debt dynamics, is equally important. Um, going forward, my country has pri prioritized education. We have increased education budget, I'm talking about numbers for 2013 onwards, by six folds in the last decade and the share of, I mean, the share of education spending in the budget is now two times what it was back in 2002. This is about next 30 years, next 40 years. Quality of human capital stock is going to be absolutely critical in terms of our ability to compete. You know, if we're going to compete with Koreans or, you know, other sort of relatively, uh, you know, countries that are doing well, we need to invest in human capital stock. We're also equally investing heavily in infrastructure as well as in, in people. Our challenge, of course, is high dependency on energy imports. If you look at the last 12 months, a current account is in surplus, but only if you exclude energy. But when you include energy, we have $56 billion of deficit. And that is the core issue in terms of competitiveness. So it's not just only the fact that it leads to current account deficit, you know, that 
you know, it raises risk premia. Many products that are not produced in Turkey that could have easily been produced in a competitive fashion, it's largely because of energy costs. And that's why a focus, a very strong focus on renewable, on local resources, and also even on nuclear, even though that is debatable. But this is, you know, we have no choice. And that's why if you look at our energy generation mix, I mean, if you look at the installed capacity right now, out of 54,000 megawatt, I'm sure our energy minister might have mentioned, about 36, 37% is hydro wind, kind of like what you would consider to be kind of renewable. But if you consider what we're building right now that is under construction, within five to seven years, we're hoping that that mix will be 46 to 53%. 46 renewable, and hopefully more local as well. So energy is one core area, really, uh, that, I mean, as far as Turkey is concerned, uh, that we need to continue. Another challenge for us, um, enhancing, which is also relevant, probably for our region, in particular Middle East, maybe not necessarily Europe, but in particular the Middle East, we need to boost labor participation among females, among women. Labor participation rate in this country um, among, I mean, for men is about 70%, which is fine. I mean, it's not great, it's fine. Uh, but when it comes to women, it's down to about 30%. And by the way, this is up from about 20, you know, 25, 26%. Why? It's all to do with education. Again, if you look at women, with university education, actually the labor participation rate is almost at par with Europe, European Union average, which is about 69, 70%, and that's the case in Turkey. But as you uh, sort of look at the overall, clearly we have a very poor situation. So Turkey's long-term outlook is quite, I mean, positive, simply because we have favorable demographics, working age population is gonna continue to grow through 2030. But equally important, if we can get the other half in a woman labor participation rate increased, which we think we can through better education, then I think the upside in Turkey becomes even more significant. Um, and that's why a decade ago, we had only 91 female students per 100 boy students. Now we have got 100.4 girl students per 100 boy students. And we've raised compulsory education to 12 years. So for me, this is really important when you take very long-term energy, you know, in terms of competitiveness, becomes extremely. One important point, again, for our region, and in particular, I think I'm sure that applies to some of our neighbors. Unfortunately, you know, international, I mean, academic studies suggest that when debt to GDP ratio for public sector increases beyond 85% for corporate sector, for household sector, when, when debt to GDP ratios go above 80, 90%, that tends to be a big drag on growth. And unfortunately, that is the case for much of OECD nation, many of OECD nations, in particular Eurozone. So I think diversification becomes also an important issue. Uh, we've been successful uh, in managing this diversification over the last few years. Uh, Europe used to account for about 57, 59% of our total exports. Now it is down to 38%, but our exports continue to grow largely because on the back of our focus on MENA region and Asia. The share of MENA region in our exports rose from about 12% to 33%. So you can imagine, had we not been successful in doing so, the fallout from Europe would have been so much more pronounced, you know, it would be so significant. So I think Europe has lost five years. I'm talking about Eurozone here. The prospects are that, unless, you know, things change quickly, that they might have a subtrend growth of another five years, or essentially, you know, I mean, if you take European Union GDP as 100 in 2007, right now it's 98. So it's actually still not where
pre-crisis, not at the pre-crisis level. So five years have been lost, another five-year risk, and I think it's important that we begin to focus again on regions where there is a lot more dynamism and you know, capitalize on, on obviously those opportunities. I'm sorry if I've taken a little bit more time, but our priority is human capital stock, both in terms of education, but also skill building on infrastructure, energy, which is included. R&D is important to move up the value chain as a big challenge for all of us. And I think we all have to be wary that in industrial world, clearly this relatively high level of debt burden is a drag on growth. And until you know, these nations that are traditional engines of global growth or has been so, fix this problem, clearly you know, we need to continue to uh, explore sort of uh, other opportunities at, while obviously continue to focus on the core markets. So uh, thank you very much. I'll, I'll be happy to answer any of your questions and, and later on. Thank you. Thank you, Mehmet. Um, Dalian, you're a minister of uh, energy and of tourism and also of, of uh, finance. And uh, you are that all of a country, Bulgaria, that is contiguous to uh, Turkey and a neighbor. Tell us about um, what you see the role of yourself and your country in contributing to what Memo was talking about, the good health of the European group of countries in getting out of the uh, economic problems that they have, uh, they have today. Also, if you would talk a little bit about South Stream and um, what are your thoughts about that and the investments that are needed to produce that, at least the portion of going through Bulgaria and how uh, you uh, plan to get those put in place. Thank you. Um, first, I want to say that I'm really impressed by everything my colleague said. I completely agree with him. and. I was listening very, very carefully because uh, we want to learn from Turkey how they managed to achieve such high growth rates in the last couple of years. And uh, hearing everything he said, I now have partial explanation of uh, why this happened. It is really important for all of us to look at the good examples and uh, try to um, multiply them so that uh, we live in a world where uh, recessions, economic and financial crisis are behind us and we are on a sustainable path, uh, on a sustainable growth path. Uh, Bulgaria is not doing that bad. Right now at the moment uh, we are only one of six countries in the European Union with a positive growth rate for this year. 21 countries according to the last statistics would uh, probably finish the, the year with um, a negative growth rate. Of course, this is not enough because our growth rate is expected to be a little above 1%. So we're definitely looking for opportunities to create this business environment that would allow our economy to grow faster. One way to do that is to keep the low tax rates that we have in Bulgaria. Bulgaria is very proud with, with, with its very low tax rates. We have 10% corporate tax rate, we have 5% tax on dividends, and we have 10% 10 uh, flat personal income tax. So we plan to keep these tax rates and we're proud that we managed to keep these very low tax rates throughout the economic crisis without increasing significantly our budget deficit. Only 2009 was uh, the only year when uh, Bulgaria had uh, higher than 3% budget deficit. Every year after that, uh, we had a budget deficit within the 3%. For this year, we expect to have a budget deficit about 1.5%. And uh, in addition to this, uh, we're proud to have one of the 
one of the lowest uh, debt to GDP ratios in the European Union, actually second lowest with uh, only between 15 and 16 percent of GDP. Uh, this uh, low tax rates and fiscal and macroeconomic stability combined with the stimulus that we try to provide for investments, large investments in the country, we believe that would uh, bring us back uh, on the road of uh, high uh, economic growth. I completely agree with my colleague that we need to invest in uh, education, we need to invest in uh, innovation and technologies. We need to make our companies more competitive and uh, by saying this, I'll try to move to my uh, other parts of uh, my portfolio energy. Uh, part of the uh, answer for making our economies and our companies more competitive is um, uh, having uh, lower cost of energy and being more energy efficient. Energy efficiency is a completely, uh, is a particularly important topic for Bulgarian countries in the region because uh, we are very energy intensive. Bulgarian economy, for example, is five times more energy intensive than Italy, which, which, uh, which is around the average. So first we need to invest in energy efficiency and second we need to have more affordable cost for the energy resources. These affordable cost for the energy resources could come from diversification, larger competition, and liberalization of, uh, of, of the market. And uh, bringing down the energy cost, improving the energy efficiency would be a key factor in the next decade, in my opinion, for uh, making our companies uh, more competitive. And um, to your question about uh, South Stream, yesterday Bulgaria took a final investment decision for uh, South Stream. So um, uh, we were actually the last country to take this final investment decision. So right now all the countries that participate in, uh, in uh, South Stream have, uh, have given it a green light in a way. Uh, on the Bulgarian territory, this project would cost, our uh, technical teams have evaluated that this project would cost about 3.3 billion euro. We have a uh, 540 kilometer pipeline with another 59 detour and uh, 300 kilometers of loops. So the pipeline itself will be around 900 kilometers. In addition to these 900 kilometers, we'll have three compressor stations, three metering station, and uh, one acceptance station on, on the border of the Black Sea. Um, for the Bulgarian territory, there are still uh, additional activities to be implemented before the start of actual construction. And, start, and construction on the Bulgarian territory cannot start before the second half of next year, earliest. What is more important for us, though, is uh, Southern Gas Corridor because South Stream would give us more security of supply because the pipeline would not go through a couple of countries before it enters Bulgaria, but from Russia, crossing the Black Sea would enter directly Bulgaria. So this would give us uh, higher security of supply because in 2009, many of you probably know, we uh, Bulgarian people and uh, Bulgarian uh, business and economy suffered uh, uh, immensely from the uh, gas crisis in uh, January in 2009. So we will improve our energy security. But what is more important for us is to diversify our sources of energy. And Southern Gas Corridor would bring gas from another source, gas from the Caspian region, to Bulgaria and the neighboring countries. So the really important project for us is uh, Southern Gas Stream, and this is our biggest alternative in gas, biggest uh, priority in uh, gas infrastructure. Where will the three plus billion euros come from? There is um, an SPV company in Bulgaria who is uh, responsible for implementing the project. 
the pro the idea of the project is to be financed 100 percent from uh, with with project financing initially in the shareholder agreement it said that up to 70 percent would be financed with loans but uh, at this final stage uh, we believe that 100 percent should be financed with project financing and uh, we have agreed with the other shareholder that the bulgarian state or the bulgarian energy holding would not provide any state guarantees or corporate guarantees or any other uh, leverage for, for the financing of this project. Ibrahim, you're uh, chairman and chief executive officer of the organization that has made possible the buying and selling of, of shares of companies that are instrumental to um, what hap happened when Mehmet talked about the tremendous volume of new jobs that was created in Turkey. Talk to us a little bit about how your organization, the exchange, has fitted into that uh, picture of helping produce that 10 percent uh, number and how it has helped produce those jobs and how, how you facilitate that and also expand into what else you think maybe uh, the countries of Europe ought to be doing in order to pull out of the problem that faces them now. Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, let me express my gratitude to Atlantic Council to organize this event. I am really delighted that my institution is able to contribute, though in a humble way, uh, and ease that the conditions that make possible this uh, event to take place in Istanbul. Well, uh, pr prior to this job, I was working at the Central Bank, and before that, I used to be an academician. Uh, I was an economist, and the, as everybody knows, the founder of modern economics, uh, economics uh, was accepted, is accepted as Adam Smith. And the name of his book is, we most of the time uh, quote it as Wealth of Nations, but the full name is An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations. So as an economist, the first question you face is why some nations are wealthier, more prosperous than the others. And uh, by coincidence, the Daron Acemoğlu, I am, I am sure uh, many of you know him, uh, he is uh, an academician at MIT. He's a classmate of mine from the high school. So, uh, I mean, you know, his field is institutional economics. So I, I personally do believe that uh, what makes the difference is really the institutions. And in that regard, of course, the capital markets and most specifically the exchanges play a role in, in uh, the, this uh, sustainable and strong growth issue. Uh, let, let me try to specify it uh, further. Uh, be, I'm being a deputy at the Central Bank. I attended several meetings of G20. Uh, it, it was a good exercise, I should say, uh, though uh, not necessarily all the time very productive, but yet uh, it, it's worth it to participate in. I, I don't remember any single meeting uh, between 2008 and 2011 where we did not mention the global balancing and the role of emerging markets in the making up of the global economy. So everybody, I guess, uh, appreciate the, appreciates the role of emerging markets. And emerging markets will definitely play a more determining role uh, in the future. And they should actually play a more determining role if we want sustainable, balanced, and strong growth for uh, the globe. Uh, but the problem with the emerging markets is that they lack institutions sometimes. Uh, so what what is the role of institution? For example, what is the role of an efficient exchange? Uh, what you are missing if you don't have one? Well, uh, it's, it's very clear to me because 
for emerging and developing economies, the backbone of the economy is small and medium-sized enterprises. And for small and medium-sized enterprises, it's very difficult to have access over bank lending, simply because banks require, of course, very strong collateral, and they look at the track record. But for SMEs, it's not always uh, the case to have uh, be to be able to provide strong collateral, nor uh, can they uh, always uh, provide strong track record. And this is not actually peculiar to the emerging markets as well. Uh, for example, I, I, I can name uh, a few names. Uh, Henry Ford, the, the, I'm the, the founder of uh, the, the automo automobile, automobile industry, uh, and uh, maybe Steve Jobs, and uh, also uh, Michael Dell. Well, what, what, what is common with them? Well, I think if there, was, there had been no well-functioning, efficient capital markets in, in their country, they would have not been able to exist ever. For example, I remember for Ford, when he applied to a bank uh, for a bank loan, it, it was in 1911, uh, I mean, the, the, the reply and the comment of the analysts was simply, well, the cars, automobiles, maybe fancy, colorful uh, toys, uh, a product of a very, very uh, rich uh, imagination, but I never think that uh, they will become a, a major uh, element in transportation, given that horses will be always with us. And they reject the, his application. And for, for, I mean, the Steve Jobs or for Michael Dell, do you think that a banker in, in very dark uh, suite will ever, never uh, be ready to open a line, open a credit uh, to uh, some guys leaving the university and gathering in the garage of their house? house? I, I don't think so. The same holds true for emerging markets. Small emerging market company. Very difficult for them to uh, be able to be financed. But they need finance because we know that, for example, for Turkey, when it comes to Turkey, the, the government put forward a strategic vision that is to make Turkey one among 10 largest economies in the world by 2023, the centenary of the establishment of the republic. It requires to have a GDP that is equal to 2 trillion US dollars, which means that we should add the existing Turkish economy one and a half Turkey in, ten, in almost 10 years. This requires investment, and for investment, you need, you need finance. Obviously, banking industry has reached its natural boundaries, and uh, given that uh, what we learned throughout the uh, recent North Atlantic, not global, uh, financial and economic crisis, uh, and bank lending is becoming tougher and tougher. And it, it, it is re really reasonable and understandable. So we, we should develop capital markets for emerging markets, and especially in this region. And to that regard, uh, I am really thankful to the government that uh, they prepared a brand new capital markets law that is pending at the parliament. It, it passed the, the first step, that is co uh, commissionary discussions. Now uh, I expect it to be brought in, into the floor uh, by, uh, before the end of this month. And it, it not only creates a playing field that is in full compliance with international standards and norms, but also it opens the gate for the exchange to restructure itself. And when we will restructure it, it will include all the available markets, all the available financial contracts. Cash equities, derivatives, commodities, even energy contracts will be uh, traded and provided to the investors at, from a single uh, access point with a single technology, single interface, single market rules, single clearing settlement uh, procedures. And I think this will help a lot to the uh, sustainable 
and strong growth for Turkey. Ibrahim, thank you. Uh, you have touched on an interesting point that leads into my next question, which I'm going to ask all three of the panelists to uh, comment on. But you mentioned um, the sponsor, original sponsor, of uh, Rami Kouch's father's business, Henry Ford, which got much of the industrialization of early Turkey started. That's 100 years ago. Um, this region has an old and wonderful history, and its energy resources and history go back a, a long time. Caspian Sea, the Black Sea, um, the uh, current uh, happenings around the Black Sea, the some call the Caspian Derby going on. But we've been in a great game. The great game began a long time ago. Um, it continues. But we've left behind the original days of the great game, which were Roger Kipley's Kim's days, and uh, George uh, McDonald Fraser's uh, Mr. Flashman's days. And in, those, in that period of time, most people looked upon the game as a zero-sum game. What was one person's game was another person's loss. Um, that has changed a lot. Um, and we are now in a game with much different rules and, and a much uh, broader um, outlook of, of, of cooperation. I think the recent um, I don't, discoveries, or maybe it's whatever, methods that are enabling and going to enable the uh, transportation of, uh, of liquefied gas um, to other sources have brought home to it, at least one and probably several countries the uh, interdependence and the fact that it, that's um, not a zero-sum game, but is one that, that we all need to cooperate in. The question I want to ask is, um, what international mechanisms do you see uh, ought to be used, and if they're not in place, ought to be put in place in order to get the nations we've been talking about to be able to work together to build the, the coalitions to do what you guys have been talking about and to succeed in being able to uh, cause what's happening in the many changes in our energy arena to be turned into uh, additional gross national product and additional benefits for the uh, population as a whole. So Mehmet, would you start out on that? Thank you. Uh, well, we would like the U.S. begin to license companies to begin to sell shale gas. That would certainly help. But uh, coming back to the region, um, clearly a big chunk of global energy resources, including natural gas, lie east of, east of Turkey. And so in some way, we're, we're natural sort of hub. Um, I think you know, more democracy would help, more stability would help, because that would make these type of projects, you know, relatively easier to implement. Uh, I guess that would certainly be helpful. I mean, Iraq is, is a now an important player, but unfortunately you've got, you know, obviously disagreements between central government and, and northern, I mean, Kurdish regional government. Uh, but clearly, while this debate goes on, while these internal uh, sort of disagreements continue, energy is out there, and that could easily be deployed for the benefits of the region, for the people of Iraq. Uh, situation in Iran, you're quite familiar. Uh, obviously, the, the problem with the international community concerns of international community, uh, you know, get in the way. I mean, the fact that Iran is, uh, is, is what it is. Uh, I mean, that, that prevents, for, you know, such uh, a large-scale cooperation. Um, in, obviously, you know, Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, Russia, 
already we have pipelines. Of course, there is considerations for additional pipelines. Uh, even, you know, yeah, I mean, you could make even a strong case if Iraq was relatively more stable and, and, and you know, more predictable, maybe you could even, even, I'm just making an argument, contemplate uh, an, a pipeline all the way from, you know, GCC countries, from Gulf. Uh, so clearly, uh, there is plenty uh, of opportunities out there. How can we get countries to cooperate and uh, to make this doable? Um, well, as I said, we're optimistic about what, is, what has happened over the past couple of years. Arab Spring has been, I'm speaking in general terms, a big disruption and a source of uncertainty as it happens. But I think in the long run, uh, clearly, we think this will lead to better, you know, uh, you know, more transparency, better, you know, enhanced standards of democracy, and of course, stability and prosperity. And this would facilitate uh, this type of cooperation on a on a bigger scale and a much easier. That's that's my own perspective. I'm not an energy specialist, so uh, but clearly we need uh, more energy to come to the market because demand is growing and resources obviously are limited and, and price. I mean, look at this year. Eurozone is in a recession. I mean, it's not flirting with recession. Eurozone is in a recession. Uh, U.S. is growing subtrend, you know, significantly below what U.S. could do. The story in Japan is nothing new. Even emerging markets, have slowed down quite quite a bit. I mean, if you look at India, China, they have the lowest sort of GDP growth uh, since the crisis. And as a headline, even including fast-growing Asian countries, you know, uh, emerging market sort of growth rate is going to be at least one or maybe one and a half percentage points lower than what it was last year. Now, despite all this you know, relatively subdued global economic outlook, Brent oil prices have not fallen, you know, meaningfully below $110 per barrel. I mean, even with all these, normally, such a global backdrop calls for substantially lower uh, energy prices, but that hasn't happened. So it's partly, obviously, uh, you know, uh, countries that are energy rich, resource rich, Unfortunately, some of them at least have relatively uh, less stable uh, backdrop and that gets in the way. So until we can probably move forward, uh, then I think we can talk about regional, you know, uh, on a bigger scale, regional cooperation, regional prosperity, regional stability. Thank you, Dalia. We do need uh, more energy. In order to get more energy, we need uh, faster and larger scale exploration, and we need uh, faster construction of uh, major pipelines so that this energy can go to the markets. Because uh, my colleague is right that even in a period of a slowdown, global slowdown, of all the economies, and uh, which means slow down in the demand of energy resources, the prices continue to go up. Um, I would only disagree that uh, large quantities of uh, oil and gas uh, lie uh, only in the Middle East and some other areas, because uh, from what we have seen in the U.S. in the last couple of years, this uh, world map of reserves is changing. There, there are new spots on the, on the world map, and the uh, future would uh, show how, um, what is the potential of these uh, spots, but uh, there is uh, huge potentials in areas where, where we never thought there would be any oil or gas reserves thanks to alternatives for alternative forms of, uh, of production. And uh, in, we should also concentrate, all of our countries, we should also concentrate to explore 
the possible um, reserves for uh, oil and gas. Uh, this is what Turkey is doing, this is what Romania is doing, Bulgaria has also started it this year with uh, one uh, deep Black Sea concession. Romania has already proven successful with quite large quantities for this region. 84 BCM of gas, this is significant for the, for the region. Turkey has also found significant uh, quantities, well, not for the Turkish market, but still significant quantities uh, based on the expectations we initially had. So uh, there is potential in the region as well. And with the unconventional forms of uh, oil and gas, uh, the map of uh, reserves worldwide uh, uh, could change. Agree. Well, I, I am afraid I am not expert in uh, oil energy, but uh, I, I'll try to answer this question. Uh, take, I mean, from a perspective of international cooperation uh, in the region. Well, the, 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 I, I think there are two aspects of your question. One being theoretical and uh, structural, the other one is practical. When it comes to the theoretical, uh, I think we have a problem, not, not uh, only in the region, but uh, as the world. Because uh, we managed to create a global infrastructure in terms of economic relations, trade relations, financial integration. It, it's a, I mean, fully integrated global system. It, uh, obviously, throughout the last crisis, we, it, it, it has become very visible. Uh, and something happens somewhere, you have the consequences and impacts uh, the other, 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 other uh, extreme of the uh, market. Uh, but yet, our mechanisms or our structures, this is the infrastructure, but superstructure uh, is really based on Westphalia Treaty or Berlin, uh, sorry, Vienna Congress. I mean, uh, back to 17 or 19 centuries, nation state systems. And it, it creates, of course, a kind of tension and uh, it's, it's very normal to have conflicts with, within the structure, global, national. Uh, and when it comes more practical uh, issues, well, I, I think as far as you can show all parties that uh, your existence will be under threat otherwise, then even under the existing circumstances, you can manage to create uh, collaboration. For, uh, let me just give you an example from my industry, exchange business. Well, in exchange business, uh, liquidity is, has become, may, maybe ha was uh, always a, a determining factor. And for the time being, 50% of the all liquidity is in two exchanges, NYSE and NASDAQ. And if, if you combine the six largest it makes 75 of the liquidity, 75 percent of the liquidity. So everybody is running after the liquidity. Uh, well, in this in in this case, of course, the economies of scales kick in, kicks in. And uh, if if you don't have uh, I'm the size, if you don't have the capacity, it 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 is really very challenging for you, given that uh, also there is a rising competition, not necessarily from other exchanges, but also alternative trading venues. So exchanges understand that if they stand alone, it will be very difficult for them. So like in the nature, I mean, two organized or organisms, when they feel that they, they will cease to exist, they come together and create like a symbiosis. Well, uh, and what, what uh, we are trying for Borsa Istanbul as of now is uh, exactly the same. We are trying to establishing a network of exchanges, an ecosystem, in which uh, there will be a win-win game. Uh, for example, uh, we established in 1995 a federation of Eurasian stock exchanges. Bulgaria is a member, Turkey is a member, and it includes Southeastern Europe, uh, West Asia, Middle East, and North Africa. Headquarters in Istanbul, 
uh, actually a few months ago we were sitting next to each other with Mr. Minister uh, at Sofia uh, on the occasion of uh, the annual assemb uh, as General Assembly of this Federation. It is, for example, a model uh, and it works because we are able uh, to uh, develop, for example, common indices or uh, ETFs that will be traded in more than one exchanges or uh, even market connectivity we can discuss. But of course, uh, I mean, normally speaking, if uh, a system is an e equilibrium, it, it will be not possible for him, for it to move. But in order to move something, you should, you should uh, show the threat and benefits. And this is the basic nature of human beings to behave. Thank you, and thank you. Um, I would like to broaden the discussion to uh, all of those of us in the room. You're free to uh, make a comment or ask questions. Um, you don't have to disguise a comment as a question if you don't want to. You can make it straight out. But let's see if I can see hands here. Uh, the late lady in the center here. Thank you. Uh, I, not, I would like to raise my question to Mr., uh, Ms., His Excellency Mr. Shimshek and to Mr. Uh, Turhan. Uh, we all know that Turkey has experienced uh, significant developments in energy liberalization. And having uh, the, the project of uh, Borsa Istanbul, uh, I would like to ask which type of uh, energy contract, contracts are you planning to introduce? And also, um, I mean, if you could give uh, further detail, also would be nice. And also, if you introduce, once you introduce, uh, are you planning to uh, bring tax incentives uh, for the exchange uh, trading of energy products uh, to further contribute to the energy liberalization of the energy markets in general? Thank you. Uh, tax incentives, well, we, it's currently not on the agenda, but certainly be, we don't have energy exchange yet, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be open to, uh, to suggestions from the exchange if that's what would facilitate it, but at this stage, I'm not sure what sort of tax incentives would be expected of us. The only incentive that we're willing to provide, of course, is to for, for renewable energy. Um, so we have set a minimum uh, sort of purchase price uh, and we believe that, you know, maybe sometimes in 2017, 2018, that would help facilitate a significant uh, sort of uh, capacity building in, in solar energy where, where Turkey obviously has an attractive or has a significant potential. Uh, we are in the process of divesting energy distribution networks. More than 50% of distribution networks are now in private sector hands. We would like to complete the sale of remaining uh, networks, hopefully by the end of this year, if not by the first quarter of 2013. The sale of energy generation assets are underway. So essentially, you know, uh, our liberalization program is you know with a bit of a delay it's still underway and uh, hopefully in a few years time essentially energy sector will be almost purely dominated by domestic or international private players uh, both on the distribution side as well as on the energy side will just be doing the regulation bit uh, as i said i'm not aware of any proposals in terms of uh, tax incentives for the trade of energy contracts on the exchange, but as I said, we could look into that. Thank you. Well, liberalizing the energy market is of utmost importance, uh, no question. And you know, for anything, any market to be liberalized, uh, the as most essential issue is uh, efficient price formation. And I don't know any uh, more appropriate milieu than exchanges for have efficient price formation. Thus, to have an energy exchange is really very critical. 
we, we have been working with the Minister of Energy on that issue, uh, and uh, we have reached an agreement uh, with them, but of course it depends on the approval of the first government, and then uh, it, it will uh, be brought into the parliament as a law. Uh, but what we have in our mind, I, I can just comment on them, uh, because otherwise I, I would uh, be uh, I'm exceeding my capacity. But what we have in our mind is that there should be two uh, separated markets, of course integrated at the same time, but in terms of cl classification. One, we can call it uh, such as cash market, which will include day ahead contracts, intraday contracts and uh, offsetting contracts, balancing contracts. Uh, on the other hand, we need, of course, to provide the forward contracts as well, uh, or energy derivatives. But as you know, electric, especially electricity, is a very peculiar uh, item. You cannot store it, and, uh, it, it, and all the financial contracts need to be settled in physical delivery. So uh, the providers, of the energy, electricity, the traders, uh, and uh, the, of course, consumers should uh, be uh, integrated uh, in, in a complete and perfect way uh, through this exchange. And that's, that's what we are trying to realize. I mean, it, it will be a separate body, not within uh, the uh, Borsa Istanbul. It will not be a market of Borsa Istanbul, rather, we uh, are planning to create a separated entity, but Mar Borsa Istanbul will be the market operator. So all the contracts will be traded at the uh, Borsa Istanbul's uh, trading venues, but uh, we need to have a separate body simply because of the peculiarity of the electricity contracts. Uh, when it comes to the uh, tax issue, of course, uh, it's, uh, it has several aspects. Uh, I do acknowledge that behind the success story of Turkey, there is obviously uh, the success in uh, fiscal policies. Uh, but of course, uh, I mean, financial contracts has their own characteristics, and uh, in, in their trading, there shouldn't be a tax. But of course, when it comes to revenue creation, it, it's something else. But simply, buying and selling a contracts, sh in, to my opinion, of course, should be evaded uh, from any kind of taxation. Just, just to add, uh, right now, I mean, equities, I mean, trading in equities, even capital gains from equities, completely tax-free. So, I mean, just to suggest, so there is no, we're not contemplating of imposing any taxes on, on trading or any other instruments. Almost all financial instruments are traded tax-free, and some of them, even capital gains, are completely tax-free, uh, yeah, just for your information. The Tea Party would love you. Um, here. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Yeah, it works. Uh, your Excellency, during very interesting presentation, uh, you mentioned a very important part of strategy in Turkey, education. And uh, we know that it's growing now by quantity. What about quality? Turkey is a part of European education system. Also, I know that uh, this year uh, came to end a program when Turkey sent uh, thousands of young students to the United States, the best American university. Are you planning to continue? Uh, also, the, there is an obvious growth of uh, religious tendency in Turkey. That's why in this situation, how are you keeping a gender balance on education well, for growing role of women uh, on a higher education process and in society? as well, also in the uh, role of women in economy, because uh, for Turkey, as a continuation of tradition of uh, secular state, it's uh, also very important. Thank you very much. May I? Thank you. Well, uh, unfortunately, quality of education is not that great in, in Turkey, so I'll be the first to admit, and if you look at PISA exam results, 
we don't fare that well. We have about 17 million primary and secondary and high school students. So primary and, and high school, 17 million. That is bigger than populations of many, uh, many of our neighbors or many nations in Europe. So it's absolutely important that not only we build, we continue to build new schools, create new universities, and, and hire new teachers, but also to improve quality. Um, on the quantity side, we've done phenomenally well. We have uh, built 180 plus thousand new classrooms. We have doubled number of universities in, in just a decade, hired 360,000 new teachers, blah, blah, blah. So numbers are great. Quality is something else. Now, quality is to do with performance-based culture, I mean, teachers. For now, what we are doing, um, there is a big uh, divergence between education, let's say, in, 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 in a place like Istanbul, or let's say in Hakkari, which is the furthest southeastern, let's say, spot in Turkey. So my government is trying, is in the process actually, uh, we have a project called Fatih Project. We are equipping every single classroom in this country, the, even the remotest village, with fiber optic, uh, sort of broadband you know, internet, with touch screen, big whiteboards, and every student from the fourth grade onwards be given a tablet PC for free, like iPad-like, you know, tablet PC. So the, 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 the objective here is that we centrally develop, you know, uh, uh, content and is accessible to every single student. Uh, so this is one way we're hoping that would, that would, you know, improve quality of education. But we know that technology cannot do it on its own. So teacher training is an important angle. Uh, you know, uh, again, uh, you know, let's say peer pressure in terms of performance measurements, in terms of incentives for successful ones, this should follow. So now as far as your other questions are concerned, we, we obviously know the importance, the significance of educating both men and women. In, in this part of the world, in the past, unfortunately, that hasn't been the case. I don't want to take more time, but let me give you a very uh, you know, uh, striking example. Uh, I come from a family, uh, my, my parents were illiterate, literally illiterate. I mean, they couldn't read and write. They couldn't speak a word of Turkish. Now, um, both of them passed away uh, years ago. I'm the youngest of nine. Interestingly, for example, none of my sisters made it beyond primary school. Even some of them didn't make it primary school. But all of my nieces and nephews, including nieces and nephews, they now university graduates or high school graduates, at least, but most of them university. So that, that tells you about the transformation that Turkey is going through. We would like to build on this because we think this is absolutely essential in terms of Turkey's long-term prosperity, long-term growth you know, uh, prospects. And, and my government, despite the fact that you know, the debate on the 12-year compulsory education in this country was hijacked by political issues, the reality is this country, if you look at population aged 25 years and above, the average years of schooling is six years, six and a half years. But if you look at OECD nations, it's 11 and a half years. So that tells you the gap between Turkey and other OECD nations in terms of productivity, in terms of competitiveness. And my government has just increased compulsory education to 12 years. If you add preschool schooling, that is likely to be somewhere about 13 to 14 years. We think this is absolutely critical. And that's why the education budget has gone up so much. Uh, we value the secular 
uh, characteristic of, of the state. But at the same time, of course, uh, you know, students, in particular uh, girls, I mean women, if they want to go to school of their choice with you know, clothing they, of their choice, that is up to them. We should pave the way for them. Why? Because if you look at overall labor participation rate, it is 30% among females in, in this country. But if you look at university graduates, it's around 70%. That, that is a very clear message that Turkey should move on and should allow choices to people. And we respect you know, everybody's way of life, their personal choices. And I think this is what makes Turkey so strong in the last, what has made Turkey so strong over the last decade and is likely to continue to, to help going forward. Thank you very much. I want to thank all of our panelists for taking time out of their busy days to be with us. We hope that uh, you're back again next year. We hope in the intervening months that you, you email us your thoughts, your ideas about uh, what we in the Atlantic Council should be uh, doing, not only next year, but throughout the year. And I want to thank everyone who came today to this session for coming here. And I believe we got a wonderful dinner, don't we, and Ross? Let me add my thanks on behalf of the Atlantic Council as a whole and, and our President and CEO, Fred Kemp, uh, to our three participants here today and to Bob Abernathy uh, for leading this session.